I've made several videos going over the best Apple ecosystems at different price points. We did one looking at $500, one where we looked at a price bracket of $1,000, and we even did one with all of the brand new cheapest Apple products that you can currently buy. But for today, I wanna to try a new approach. Instead of focusing on a price target, I wanna focus on the devices. What you see in front of you is an ecosystem based on maximizing value. No compromises, but we're still saving a ton of money over a new setup. Today's video is sponsored by Declutter, a fast, safe, and reliable way to sell your unwanted tech. They were even kind enough to provide the devices seen in today's videos. Declutter will buy your old tablets, phones, laptops, and even consoles and video games. Declutter makes it fast and easy. They offer free shipping and they'll pay you the day after your items arrive. You can easily trade in your old MacBook to put towards a newer one and save a ton of money in the process. They also pay 30% more than most carriers for your used iPhone, and it only takes seconds to get a valuation. Plus, Declutter has provided an exclusive code for you guys that you can use to get 10% extra value on everything you sell. So head over to Declutter and use code MIANI10. So what exactly does a no compromises used Apple ecosystem entail? That would mean that you would want everything to be new, right? Because that's where all the latest features are. Well, not quite. The way I see it, price is a compromise. So $2,400 to get the least expensive new 16-inch MacBook Pro might come with a lot of really great features, but $2,400 is a compromise. So the goal here is to get the most amount of features that you would expect or want from an Apple ecosystem while also providing a good value. With that being said, let's run through the devices. First up is the iPhone. In my previous videos, I've been using the iPhone 6 generation because those things have gotten pretty cheap. Last time in the $1,000 ecosystem, I went for an iPhone 8 because it came with the same guts as an iPhone 10, but with a lot less cost. This time though, screw it. I want OLED, I want thin bezels, I want face ID, it's iPhone 10 time. In this setup, we aren't trying to maximize price per dollar, we want enjoyment and feature set per dollar. I know it might not matter for some, but the more modern design and feel of the 10 series is notable. iPhone 10 still feels as current as any modern phone, and it runs just as smooth as well thanks to Apple's incredible optimization and chip design. The A11 chip is a solid performer, and the 10 itself doesn't feel or really look like a three-year-old smartphone. While it might not be the best performance per dollar compared to an iPhone 8, the iPhone 10 is a really decent value, actually. You can get these things for about $450 or ones with higher storage tiers like mine, which has 256 gigabytes for a little bit closer to 500. So that's not a whole lot more expensive than the iPhone SE, which sure does have newer internals and better performance, but there's definitely a case to be made for the iPhone 10. When you consider that you're adding in an OLED display, dual cameras, newer design language, better battery life, I think it's worth the trade. Sure, the iPhone SE is new, it has a warranty, it has an A13, you'll get longer support from iOS, but I think that the iPhone 10 is a better choice for a lot of people. I even think there's a solid case for picking the 10 over the iPhone 8. Even though an 8 is significantly less expensive, I personally haven't had the desire to switch back to my iPhone XS Max. Both the iPhone 8 and SE were great to use and are totally doable, but I felt myself wanting to switch back. The 10 feels just as modern as any new iPhone does. I mean, if you're looking at this thing from the front, it is indistinguishable from the iPhone 11 Pro, which is $1,000. And I'll be honest, the iPhone SE with the A13 is super duper buttery smooth, but I really don't notice any lagging or stuttering with this phone. Next up, let's talk about the MacBook. And this one should be obvious if you watch the channel. 
it's gotta be the mid 2015 15 inch MacBook Pro with dual graphics. Why not something newer? Well, a no compromises setup can't realistically have a butterfly keyboard in it. And besides, the 2015 has plenty of performance to offer as well as a great price tag. My machine has a 2.5 gigahertz quad core i7, 16 gigabytes of RAM, AMD Radeon M370X graphics with two gigabytes of VRAM and a one terabyte NVMe SSD. The 2015 is the best of a great generation. It has plenty of ports, including USB 3, HDMI, dual Thunderbolt 2 ports, and an SD card slot. We also have the benefits of upgradable storage thanks to handy dandy SSD adapters. I'll have those linked in the description below. The mid 2015 for a lot of people is pretty much the quintessential MacBook, at least until the 16 inch gets cheap in a couple years. Now, if we take a look at this MacBook from a performance perspective, it's not the Titan it once was. Thanks to the core wars of recent years, you can outperform this i7-4870HQ with a base model 13-inch MacBook Pro, but there are still plenty of reasons to choose the mid-2015. For one, there's the dedicated graphics. They aren't super powerful by today's standards, but they'll definitely beat the Iris graphics on an entry-level MacBook Pro and give you the added compute power to help out with renders, transcoding, and CAD designs. Those applications will also love the 15-inch display, which really doesn't give up much compared to newer MacBooks. Sure, the 16-inch is bigger and brighter, and newer MacBooks have True Tone displays, whereas this one doesn't, but frankly, I don't think a lot of people care about that stuff very much. The mid-2015 is also great because we still get modern amenities, like gigabyte per second read and write speeds on the SSDs, a force touch trackpad, and solidly reliable scissor switch keyboard. The mid-2015 really does hit the sweet spot in terms of performance and value, as well as reliability and function. I mean, there's a reason why everyone, including myself, say that this is one of the best MacBooks of all time. And the best part is, nowadays you don't have to break the bank to get into one of these. On average, a well-equipped dual graphics model in decent condition can be had for about $1,000. You can definitely find them for even less than that, but nice ones like this one with a warranty from Declutter, around $1,000, that's a pretty decent price point. The only thing that I would caution against if you are looking at one of these, be very sure that you know which model you're buying. The base model 2015s had integrated graphics and you had to step up to the higher tier model like this one to get dedicated graphics. So when you're buying one of these, be sure to double and triple check so you know what you're buying. The next pillar in the ideal Apple ecosystem is the iPad. Honestly, since I've been doing these videos, I've tried a lot more budget iPads and I'm overcoming my apathy towards the category. Since I sold my original iPad mini a few years ago, I've not really had a lot of interest in the iPad, but nowadays it's becoming a lot more versatile and useful. To me personally, there's one feature that I love more than anything else on an iPad, ProMotion. High refresh rate displays are my jam, so for me, the ideal budget iPad has to be the 10.5 inch iPad Pro. This is my favorite iteration of the pre-2018 iPad Pro redesign. It's got slim bezels, outrageously thin housing, and of course, that magical ProMotion display. When you pair this buttery smoothness and large 10.5 inch 2224 by 1668 panel with the multitasking features of iPad OS, the experience is simply sublime. I still maintain that for a lot of people, an iPad is not a replacement to a MacBook, but you can find a used 10.5 inch iPad Pro for as little as $350 on eBay. Or you can step it up to nicer refurbished ones with warranties, more storage and cellular connectivity for around $500, less than a decent 13 inch Retina MacBook Pro. It does make me wonder. Personally, I don't think a $1,300 iPad is better than a $1,300 MacBook, but is a $350 iPad better than a $350 MacBook? That I think you could make an argument for. We're talking about unibody MacBook Pro money for something like this with a Retina ProMotion display, iPad OS support, and 
arguably more modern functionality than an older MacBook anyway. iPad OS is becoming a lot more intuitive and productive with trackpad and mouse support, full-size keyboard options, and an increasing number of apps. I mean, you can't deny that this is by far more portable than a MacBook Pro or even an 11 inch MacBook Air. Fortunately, in an ideal ecosystem, we don't have to choose between a MacBook and an iPad. So we have the ability here to carry a laptop for full fat applications and a surprisingly versatile tablet that can come with us on the go. Something that's been consistent through every Apple ecosystem video I've done is how well all of the products work together. That's obviously the whole point of the Apple ecosystem and that's why these videos are so interesting to me. But in the past, we've always had to give up some, shall we say, luxury features in order to hit our price targets. Whereas here, we don't really have to do that. We're still getting the benefits of dedicated graphics and quad-core processors and plenty of fast flash storage here. We've also got the new design, Face ID, OLED display. We've got ProMotion here on the iPad. These are checking a lot of boxes. Now, obviously this ecosystem is not cheap. The MacBook is about $1,000. The iPhone is about 450. And the iPad is, we'll call it 400 on average. So we're looking at about $1,850 for this setup. That's certainly not cheap, but when you compare it to the new equivalents of these models, it's definitely pretty solid. Now, when I say new equivalent in this case, I'm not talking about a 16 inch MacBook Pro, 11 inch iPad Pro, and an iPhone 11 Pro. To make the comparison a little bit more fair about you know performance and functionality, we could compare this MacBook to a four Thunderbolt port 13 inch MacBook Pro that would have similar CPU performance or a 10.5 inch iPad Air, which looks almost identical to this or an iPhone 11, which is a little bit less expensive than an 11 Pro. But even looking at those less expensive categories, you're still gonna be making some compromises by buying the new ones. You'd be giving up ProMotion, OLED, and a larger display and dedicated graphics. And it would still cost more almost $3,000. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to dump all over new Apple products or tell you that you shouldn't buy them. As with a lot of things in the tech world, there's not always a clear answer, but there is always a clear alternative. And buying used, specifically these used products, is a really compelling alternative. You may be wondering why I omitted the Apple Watch from this ecosystem, and there's two main reasons. Number one, in my previous videos where I have included it, a lot of people have said that they don't really care about the Apple Watch. And I can definitely see that. I think the Apple Watch for a lot of people is an accessory. It's something that you add after you have the rest of your setup, and I totally understand that. And the, woo. And the second reason is a no compromises Apple Watch for me, has an always on display. So it's the current model, not really in keeping with the used value oriented concept here. So let me know in the comments below what you think. Are these good picks for the best value and least compromised Apple products that you can buy used? Let me know in the comments below or on Twitter at Luke Miani. As usual, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out my subreddit down in the description below and I will see you all in the next video.